to be together. She sure is. That's that's just aggressive. We started doing that now. Well, hey, um, I want to jump into tonight's lesson. We've been continuing our theme of real Christianity, and I want to entitle today's lesson "Real Christianity: Colon Real Relationships." It's a lot of relationships in a lot of different places, and if we're honest, every day we are involved in relationships. That's no surprise. But the world has one way of doing it. We have another way of doing it. God has a different way of doing it. And because it's so wrapped up in our life, um, we're going to figure out how to do it really in God's way. And this is, and to some degree, this is basic Christianity, but in another degree, this is advanced expert Christianity. This is something when you're 80 years old, you're still going to be learning, scratching your head and figuring out, well, how do I do it God's way, which is the best way. And so we have a lifelong of learning ahead of us. But um, with, with that, we're going to jump into the scriptures. Tati told me that she doesn't start taking notes until we start looking at scripture. So I'm going to go ahead and look at a scripture, and then we're going to dig into our lesson together. So real Christianity, real relationships. We're starting our scripture, we're starting our lesson today in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. We're actually going to be looking for the most part of our lesson in Ephesians. It is a book, uh, amongst many other things, talking to the church in Ephesus, a large church, a church that Timothy was leading. It's talking to a church that has a lot of different influences going on, a lot of different attacks going on within the church um, from foreign, you know, foreign entities or even within the church with false doctrine. And this one of the, the underlying messages that Paul gives in the book of Ephesians is about relationships about community within the church, about the one other way. And probably no more, no other book talks more about relationships than the book of Ephesians. So if you're scratching your head, as I've done before, saying, hey, how do I grow in these relationships? Spend some time in the book of Ephesians. You know, I, I was a, a junior in college and I, I, you know, I had the best of friends. Mark was my roommate. I was living with a couple of other disciples. But even though I was in the midst of so many people, I, I felt very much like I feel so lonely. And it's hard to explain because in the church, we're people people. We're always around people. And those of you who are COVID babies, COVID Christians, you know, this might be new to you, but when we're back together in, in person, we're around people all the time. And for a while, I was around people all the time. Yeah, you know, I was feeling so lonely. And so I knew that relationships are really important. And we're going to look at why they're so important in a little bit here. I knew that they were so important. And I, I, all I knew to do, and I don't recommend you copy me in this, but all I knew to do was two of the, the guys, of, two of my friends, who are some of my, I don't know if heroes in the faith is the right word, but just great examples of how to be a great friend. They were studying abroad in Spain for the entire semester. And I, I decided, you know what, bag this. I'm going to take my spring break. I'm going to go over to Spain and I'm going to spend 10 days with, with guys who I know are great friends. And I'm going with the sole purpose of I'm learning how to be a good friend by going out there, being with my brothers in Spain and came back, learned a lot of things. And, and hopefully some of the things I share tonight um, are definitely lessons that I learned while I was out there and beyond and since. But the Bible teaches us. And so I could have saved a lot of money on flights if I just read the book of Ephesians. But amen to that. So Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. And I love this verse. Paul says, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities of the heavenly realms. There's a lot of context there. Sorry for jumping into the middle of the verse. But just know, Paul is talking about the Gentiles coming in. Uh, mixing with the Jews, all these different types of peoples and cultures and backgrounds coming together. And it says his intent, God's intent, was that through the church, the manifold, the many folds of God's wisdom would be revealed, not just to the world, but to the heavenly realms, to the angels, to the authorities, to, to the creatures beyond. Essentially what God was doing is God's looking down and he's looking at his church and he's saying, Look closely, because right here within the church, within the, the group of Christians, are the folds of my wisdom being revealed. You know, maybe you've heard of this idea of a magnum opus. A magnum opus is it's a large, important work of art or literature, especially one regarded as the most important work 
that an artist or a writer has ever produced. It's the highlight of someone's career. You know, Da Vinci has the Mona Lisa. Michelangelo has this, the sculpture of David. Quentin Tarantino has Pulp Fiction. Hans Zimmer has Lion King, and I believe Tarzan too. Michael Jackson, get this. Shout out to all the Jackson fans out there. Michael Jackson's Thriller album is without a doubt his magnum opus. In 1984, it was an eight time Grammy award winning album, album of the year. It had a $750,000 budget. And since it was released, it has made over $135 million. All right, go ahead and put the percentage in the chat. I have no, I have no idea how much the revenue is on that, but it's crazy. Every song within that album was on the Billboard Top Hits for a very long time. Very few albums have the ability to say that. That was Michael Jackson's magnum opus. It was the highlight of his career. It was his art and all, you know, if you're telling somebody to go listen to Michael Jackson, where do you send him? You send him to the Thriller album. You wanna know Da Vinci? You say, go look at the Mona Lisa. You wanna know Quentin Tarantino? Skip all the movies, go, go look at that movie. Or go look at Lion King for Hans Zimmer if you want to understand some good music. You know, the, the, the magnum opus, it captures the essence of the creator. And God, I can imagine God gathering up in this verse, gathering up the heavenly hosts. Let's come near. I want to show you something. God's most legendary work of art, every bit of his wisdom is revealed layer by layer within the church. How? And that, that is crazy. That's amazing. You think about how God views the church. That, that sentence alone is that every, you know, the manifold wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God is revealed right here in the body of Christ. Wow. Now, why is that? I mean, we can go around and we can share why that might be. You think about all the different cultures and political ideologies and races and backgrounds coming together and despite their differences, not only neglecting the differences, differences for a little bit, but accepting one another and loving one another despite the radical differences. Right here in the church, you have a pocket within a dark world, Satan's playground. You've got poking through eternity, through the hearts and lives of his disciples in the relationships that exist within the church. My goodness, you've got little Jesuses running around all across New York and New Jersey, right here in the church. What else? Oh my goodness. The fact that we wake up early on a Sunday morning, that's, that's an aspect of God's manifold wisdom <laughs> being revealed that college students are waking up before 10 a.m. on Sunday. Just joking. But, you know, in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus goes one step further and he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the father. Even Jesus says, hey, you guys, the church, the Christians, the relationships, you guys are going to do even greater things than I did. No limits. Go for it. And that's amazing. That's how God views his church. He doesn't view it as just one of, the, one of the songs on the album that you kind of throw out there to get the people going. It is the heart of the album. It is, it is the, the, the very highlight of his career. He brings the heavenly host together and says, look at my creation. It reveals my very nature. That's how God views the church. Not as an optional thing, not as a, a throwaway thing, but as integral to the lives of disciples. Look closely, examine this, he says to the, the nations. It is every bit of my being and my wisdom. You know, if that's how God views the church, how do you view the church? How do you view the people within the church? Church is not a building. It's a set of relationships that exist between saved Christians. God looks at this and says, you are emanating who I am and revealing to the universe, my very nature. And it's in the relationships right here. And so I think if we're looking to grow in deep relationships and real relationships, we need to go no further. It happens right here. The interconnection we have between one another 
This is where God is revealing his greatness. This is something that we have to value. You have to value if it's going to be the very manifold wisdom. It could be an art piece in the gallery that if we're not careful, isn't being displayed appropriately, or it can be the very essence of God himself, really living it out, displaying not only to the world, but to the kingdom, his goodness. So I got two points for tonight, and Brielle's going to chime in. She's got some really good things to share. And this is, you know, this isn't a lesson about the church. This is a lesson about family and about relationships and friendships. We're not going to be talking about dating at all today, but I do think it's just important to talk about friendships and relationships with your fellow disciples. And this is who we need in order to get to heaven. And really it's one of the greatest joys of being a Christian. All of my memories while in, in campus ministry, very few of them are spurred around me as an individual, but they're spurred around laughter and jokes and hard times and good times and bad times. You know, Jordan Jones will never let me down the fact that I almost burned down William Patterson because I was getting him a breakfast sandwich um, one early morning, my freshman year, like some of the best memories we have are going to be with our relationships. It's the very essence of our being. And so here we are looking at the expert Jesus, um, Paul, the church teaching us what do we need to do to have real relationships within real Christianity? Two points. My first point is we have to fight for family. You know, the Bible talks about how Jesus is uh, the son of God, and therefore we are also sons of God, so sons and daughters of God. So therefore we are brothers and sisters with Jesus and brothers and sisters with one another. And so by default, you are baptized into a family. But that kind of becomes like a, a catchphrase that we use. It becomes a word that when you hear it enough, it stops carrying the weight that it should. And we can say that we're family, but just because we've been given the title of family doesn't mean that it feels like family is that if we're going to be a family that is interconnected, relationally tight friends in the family that you want to be a part of, it requires a fight, requires some hard work. And so Paul says in Ephesians 3.10, hey, the manifold wisdom of, of God himself is being revealed through the church. He continues in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the hope you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. It's a great verse. Fighting for family. You know, it says here, Right in the beginning, he goes, live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Whether you know it or not, the value or the, the calling that you've received is to be God's greatest masterpiece, to be God displayed in a work of art as part of the church. And again, this isn't a lesson about commitment to the body of Christ. It is a lesson about relationships. But God makes it very clear. He's saying, hey, the vibrancy, the relationships that we ought to have live up to what I'm telling my heavenly hosts about you. Just make, make every effort to be what it is that I've valued you at and I've made you to be. He goes, make, make every effort. You know, Paul, this word where he says urges in the NLT, it's translated as beg and elsewhere it's translated as he, he begs them earnestly and desperately. Paul is begging the church, guys, Girls, make every effort to be unified, to be close to one another. You know, it's a fight. And it goes, make every effort to keep the unity through the bond of peace. You know, for some of us, and especially in this new campus region that's being formed, and um, I've said before, the COVID babies and all these different things going on, we might hear this word, keep the unity, and be scratching our heads be like, well, there's not a lot of unity to be keeping right now. And so maybe the better way to be looking at this is make every effort to make the unity. Make every effort to become family relationally. 
That's essentially what Paul is charging us to. If there is unity, keep it. If there is no unity, make it. Go ahead and build that. And, and fighting for the family, you know, this requires, how do you make unity? This requires spending time together, so much time together. You know, again, this is this is the manifold wisdom of God. This is God's magnus opus, mag, mag, magnus op, what is it? Magnus opus, right? This is God's greatest creation. You should want to spend time together with other disciples. God wants to spend time with his disciples, as, as should we. You know, I remember as a, a young college student, um, spending time together was, it was sort of just what we did. That's just how we operated. As we're going back in the fall, hopefully that's what it looks like for us as well. But man, I remember we've got Bible talk on Wednesday night, or so we'd have midweek on Wednesday night, then after midweek, we'd go and hang out across the street in Montclair, go to, go to some Cold Stone Creamery, or we'd kick it until 10 o'clock until we have to get kicked out. And then, you know, you go home after getting some food, wake up on Thursday. You know, I, you know, I used to have Bible talk on Thursday. It's I'd see the disciples there. We share faith together. We go to Bible talk and we kick it for a while afterwards. We'd be in Bible studies. We'd be sharing our faith. You go to work Thursday night. And then after work, you hang out. We've got a movie night at the brother's house. And then Friday, get do it all over again before Family Devo or Family Friday Night Live on Friday night. You know, I just remember, and then dates on Saturdays and Sunday church, and then kicking out somebody's house to watch football after church on Sunday. It was like, it was a, it's a joy. And for me, it was a joy to be together with the disciples, to be together as a family. It, it didn't feel like a sacrifice at the time. Now, now I think about that, I'm like, well, that's a lot. But at the time, it felt like a joy. I, I want to be with my friends. I want to be with my family. These are God's people. And uh, we wanted to be close together. And, and honestly, those relationships and those time, that time that was spent, and you could say sacrifice, that, that time that was given to relationally building within the church, it paid off. You know, six of the eight groommen, groomsmen in my wedding were from that time relationally in campus. Guys that, you know, it was small seeds planted day after day after day that eventually led and bloomed into meaningful, rich, lifelong relationships. And that's what's so, so important about fighting for family and fighting for relationship is that, is that it needs to be prioritized. You might look at it and go, man, I'm, I'm not going to reap the benefits of it right away. And, you know, certainly you will relationally, but just knowing that the, the relationships you're going to draw from outside of college and beyond come from the investments that are made here. You know, and I think it, it takes it takes work to have great relationships. And that's what Paul says, make every effort, you know, live, live according to the calling that you've been given. You know, it does take work. And I, I don't think people quite understand the kind of work that it takes to have family. You know, I, I didn't for a while. I used to look at, a, at a, a different group, maybe inside New Jersey or in New York when I was a college student, or maybe even a different ministry. I'd look at it and go, wow, they're having so much fun. They're so having so much family. Like, why am I not having that? And I could, I don't know if jealousy is the right word, but I would go, I, I really want that. But I kind of just chalked it up to, well, that's just them. What I didn't realize, and this is the truth of the scripture and beyond, was that building family and having fun, it doesn't just happen. It isn't just people, the right people get together and just kind of cooks. No, it says it takes effort. It takes sacrifice. You know, it's, it's not going to just happen. It's going to happen when rides are given to people who don't live that, that close. Um, it's going to happen when, you know, you, you go out to Applebee's late at night and the, the brother around you, the sister around you doesn't forgot her wallet and she doesn't have any money. But hey, you want her to come still because you love her and you want to spend time with her. It's the long rides of, of car rides and retreats and all these different things. It's, it's the times where you're given a ride or you're hopping on the train and the person doesn't give you gas money or doesn't pay for the toll or whatever. And, and you give it to them anyway, because it's all about the relationships. So we're fighting for family. We're not going to let Satan separate us. But that's, that's a big heart of what we're trying to do here is that making this family that we're trying to, to have doesn't just happen. It requires hard work requires sacrifices can require some 
thankless moments, but certainly it is always going to be worth it because we are revealing to heaven and we're revealing to one another God's multi-layered wisdom that he has. Brielle's going to come up here and she's going to share. Um, I'm going to give her a heads up. Brielle, come on up here. <laughs> she's downstairs. Oh, and share. She's going to go. All right, let's give it up for Brielle. Hey, everybody. Did you open it? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, hi, I'm excited to share with you guys today. Um, when I think of what Matt is talking about, about friends being like family, um, I immediately thought of Proverbs 18, verse 24. And I'm going to read it in the NLT. Um, and it says, there are friends, literally there's quotes there, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. And when I think of this time of, do I have just friends or real friends that are closer than, you know, brothers or sisters to me? I did, I right away thought of my sophomore year of college. And, um, you know, at that time, I went to William Patterson University and there were three brothers living on campus and three sisters living on campus. And I lived 10 minutes away from campus and I just think we just spent so much time together that semester. And I think it would have been easy for me to feel left out or on the side being the one not on campus, but I didn't let that distance keep me from being part of the fun. Um, I used to sleep over on campus with the sisters like almost at least once a week. And, you know, we would all just meet up and watch TV together and get food together. Um, we would prank each other and, you know, we would embarrass ourselves with faith sharing challenges and, you know, doing homework together, just everything we could think of. We just spent all of our time together and it was so much fun um, just living our lives together. And I even remember one day coming home from campus to find one of the sisters like taking a nap in my bed with my dog. And I didn't even know she was going to be there. <laughs> like, like it was just, we had that kind of comfortability with each other that was just built from Matt was, what Matt was saying, was just spending so much time together. Um, and I, you know, I know Matt shared too, like that that wasn't just, we didn't just naturally all love each other that much, you know, of we honestly were very different people, a lot of us. But I think like the more time we spent together, it really was the more we wanted to spend time together. It was like amplifying the effect. Um, and we did, we had to sacrifice to make that happen. You know, I used to wake up around seven and usually get to campus by eight or 9.30 for class. I would leave campus at three o'clock, go to work from three to seven and and then after come back on campus for a few hours or spend the night or go to midweek, things like that. It was definitely a full schedule, but I really don't even remember it feeling ever full ever um, because it is just, I think we became so comfortable in each other's presence and just genuinely enjoyed each other's company because of the amount of time we had invested in each other. And so, you know, if I'm sharing these stories and you're not feeling like you have that kind of closeness, I think a great question to ask yourself is, um, how can I start spending more time with my brothers and sisters? And am I willing to go that extra mile to get out of my house and to go make memories with my brothers and sisters? And again, the scriptures I read to start us off was there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I really believe that spending that time together is just an essential ingredient in becoming not just a friend, but the kind of friend that does stick closer than a brother. Can you go up here? Sure. All right. Thanks, Bree. You know, I think. Um, College students, all of us, I think we, we tend to spell love, T-I-M-E. I think it's a it's it's our terrible spelling, but it's also true is that we we deep relationships, real relationships, can't be forged in in quick moments. It's forged with time, and forge. I think time often is a sacrifice. You know, getting on that train or taking the ferry over 
taking the car ride or hopping on public transport to get somewhere, it can feel like, and I'm not talking about meetings of the body, I'm just talking hangouts and relationships. Like, is it worth it? And the answer is yes. Man, this God, God wants the connection for us and to have fun and to have family. And so I wanna come here to our last point and that's forging family. So uh, uh, fighting for family is our first point. The second point is forging family. You know, to forge something means to make or shape by heating it in a fire or in a furnace, then proceeding to beat and hammer the material. All right, well, I'm not advocating for any kind of violence amongst the campus ministry or relationally, but I think it is just something to be interesting here is that, you know, to have two separate metals come together and be forged into one, I'm talking about deep relationships, to have those metals come together, it requires great heat. It requires sometimes pain and stress. Here it says hammering and beating. Um, but it's very similar for our relationships in God's kingdom, is that family and deep relationships are not built without conflict and challenges. Instead, they're shaped when we put high temperatures, we apply high temperatures to our lives and to our relationships, temperatures that are uncomfortable, Temperatures where it breaks down walls and barriers and molds and melts us into one. You know, the truth about some of these forging and materials is that the higher the temperature or the, the more precious the material, the higher the temperature. You know, lead, when you're trying to melt and mold lead, that's 681 degrees Fahrenheit. Gold, on the other hand, you're trying to melt gold. The melting point is 1900 and 48 degrees Fahrenheit. We all know that vibranium, you know, that takes 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to mold. But that's the point is that when something is so precious, which is God's church, it's going to require some high heat, it's going to require some, some deep, um, uncomfortable at times, high temperatures. You know, deep relationships within the church are valuable. And facing some discomfort will always be worth the temperature. You know, that high, high temperature leads to powerful forging. Some of these examples are, you know, with openness and confession, challenges and rebukes, embracing and experiencing success, successes and failures together, addressing disagreements, apologizing and making amends for when you blow it, going through hard times within families, deaths and funerals. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just the goods, the good times that forge the relationships and the fun that forges family, but instead it's through the challenges, especially the harder the challenge, honestly, the closer God's church gets. And that's his plan. So Brielle's gonna come and she's gonna share one more time, just talking about how um, her relationships have been forged with some high temperatures. All right, sorry, we're like playing musical chairs here as we're trying to get set up. Um, but so something that I think is so important and that I valued so much in some of my deepest friendships um, during my campus ministry time was that um, having friendships that were heaven focused. Um, and I wanted to read, Matt already read it, but, oh wait, no, sorry. I'm gonna read Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 4, verse nine through 12. Um, and I'll read it in the NLT version, if you guys want to follow along. Um, it says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. And I really loved reading this scripture, thinking of my friendships. And there's like just really validating things in this scripture. It says that friends are there to help each other succeed. That when one of us falls spiritually, it's the job of the other to reach out and help them to get back up. That we shouldn't be alone in this. And the scripture says that when we're attacked by ourselves, we will be overcome. But when a friend steps in to help, it says that we will be able to conquer. And the truth is that we all will have times where we fall spiritually. You will be attacked spiritually and you'll need to have friends 
who are determined to help you get to heaven to make it through it. And one of those moments where I really needed my friends was my senior year of high school. And I'm sure you guys have heard me share one before because it was like um, just a time that I was really struggling spiritually of not really reading my Bible, not being connected to God. And eventually at one point I was kind of seeing this non-Christian guy and um, a lot of you guys might know Jessica Almiron. She was in our campus ministry. She's been my best friend forever. And um, one day we were driving together somewhere and we were just talking and I just like half mentioned this guy, you know, like enough to like say I talked about it, but like not really to be getting open. But Jessica did not let it slide. Like she heard me say something that she knew was hurting me spiritually and she didn't, she didn't let it pass. She brought it up again, made sure we talked about it and made sure I knew that it was not okay that I was living in this way. And, you know, Matt talked about having hot temperatures in your friendships and I did not react well. <laughs> I turned her in the car. I remember yelling at her for the things she was saying to me and I'm really not a yeller. Um, so it was wild, but you know, now looking back at that conversation, I'm so grateful for Jessica. And something that I respect so much about that moment is that she was willing to risk that I'd be mad at her to help me to get to heaven. And who knows where I would be if Jessica wasn't there to help me in that moment when I had fallen spiritually, if she had just let it slide, cause that was easier than being confrontational and, and literally getting yelled at, you know? And so I think a question to ask ourselves is, are you a Jessica to your friends? And when you see a friend struggling spiritually, do you step in and speak the truth? Or do you let fear of how they will respond stop you? If you don't speak up when you see someone being attacked spiritually, it's like walking by someone literally getting beat up and doing nothing to stop the fight or to ensure that they will come out okay. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, the scripture said, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Are your friendships heaven focused or fun focused? You know, any, any other focus just won't, it won't help us to get to heaven. And a heaven focused friendship is one where you talk about what you're learning in your quiet times, where you ask each other spiritual questions and you're willing to challenge each other to be more like Jesus. Um, a heaven focused friendship is also one that fights to maintain peace. You know, I shared about my best friend, but if we're talking about our campus ministry as a whole being like family, you're not just naturally gonna gel with every single person. Just like in a regular family, you don't just get along with all your family members. There will be problems. We will get under each other's skin, but family has to be committed to dealing with those problems and not ignoring them because ignoring problems only makes them grow bigger. In Romans 12, verse 17 to 18, it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And Ephesians 4, which has been read like twice already today, the Spirit clearly wanted everyone to hear this scripture. It says, um, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And these scriptures make it clear that it is each of our own personal responsibility to make peace with those around us. And it's easy, I think, to play the blame game when it comes to resolving conflicts. And I know I can have thoughts like, you know, if they have a problem, they should come talk to me about it. Or when she apologizes, then I'll go talk to her and make this right. Or we can even minimize the problems between each other of like, oh, it it wasn't that big of a deal. I'll get over it. You know, I just need some space and we can like downplay things that are really starting to cause division in our hearts. And these scriptures say that we have to be careful when it comes to that. It literally uses that word that we have to make every effort to keep peace, not some effort or to try a little, but to make every effort. Is there someone in your spiritual family right now that you don't feel completely at peace with? 
the, the spirit might be using this moment to prompt you to seek peace with that person. And don't wait. If the spirit is prompting you, obey it. Obey him. And do what the scripture says. Be humble, be patient, be gentle, but make every effort to maintain peace. You know, you could make that call tonight when this, as soon as this midweek ends and, and work towards making every effort of peace. Fighting for peace leads to a family that you genuinely enjoy spending time with. And it's uncomfortable for everyone when there is some tension between brothers and sisters that isn't, isn't dealt with. And you just don't want that in your family. A heaven-focused friendship doesn't hold grudges or give bitterness any space to grow. Ooh. All right. Thank you, best friend. All right, we're coming in for a landing here. There, there's so much more to be said about relationships. And I think some of you guys could actually do some master classes on great friendships. You know, downstairs in my living room, I've got Josh and Matulak, Amber, Tati, and Corrali, who are just legends at friendships. And, uh, just, you know, just as I was thinking about this lesson, I was sharing with a brother who came and, and actually stayed, him and his wife stayed at our house last week. And, and I was just mentioning about, yeah, you know, fellowship is fun and all that. And he kind of stopped me. He's like, you know, Matt, like I heard you say that, but fellowship doesn't mean fun. Like, yeah, it can be fun, but that, that, that's a country club. Country clubs are all about fun. They're all about comfort. And God's church is not a country club. It's like, whoa, bro, you're staying at my house. Chill. No, I'm just kidding. I was grateful that he said that. But, you know, he, he made the point that the church is a family and families are designed to help foster love and help babies mature <laughs> and, and to mature into uh, mature adults. And I think that's where what we're trying to fight for here amongst our family is that it's, it's, there's going to be great times. And we got to fight for those great times. You know, when you get the choice of, should I just stay home or, or can, I, can I go? Should I go? I would encourage you to fight for it. Go for it. But also know that it's not all about fun. You know, great relationships, God's plan for deep and meaningful relationships, it's going to require openness and confession. You know, Proverbs 27 or Proverbs 28, 13, we you know whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. Whoever, whoever you know, confesses it and renounces it finds mercy. Um, those relationships require openness. And it's going to require some exposure and hard conversations, but that's healthy. You know, fostering and forging relationships is going to require... Um, It's going to require, sorry, I had it written down here. It's going to require being spiritual, keeping Jesus at the center. You know, there's a lot of relationships that I've had that are fun and, and all that. But when time when it comes time to go deep, it's like, I feel weird talking about spiritual things with my brothers or my sister. Hold on a second. Can you guys hear me? Brielle's yelling at me that I'm muted. I think she's muted. Oh, well. Anyway, um, yeah, just coming for a landing here. It's like these relationships are ones that we get to talk about and have the hard conversations, have fun, be open and experience it. Because God's manifold wisdom, his masterpiece is being revealed right here. So that's it. There's a, there's a lot of good opportunities we have now to have some conversations. So I think when we talk about relationships, paranormal activity, uh, when we talk about relationships, I think we all need some help. And so we're gonna go into D groups here and I just got two questions for you. The first question is, how are your friendships in the church? I know that's kind of a, a weird question to talk about in a D group, but if you don't mind just being vulnerable and I mean, how is it going is kind of a loaded question, but more of like, what are some strengths and weaknesses of your friendships in the church? And then one other question is, what, what's one thing that you can do before the summer gets out, before the fall starts, to really forge deep and meaningful relationships uh, amongst your brothers and sisters in the campus ministry? Okay, so what are some strengths and weaknesses of your friendships? And what's one thing that you can do to really forge relationships in the campus ministry. All right, we're going to break into discussion groups. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for uh, putting up with our technical difficulties. Love you guys. And um, 
Yeah, feel free to close out in prayer. We got to split into D groups.